One of the things you notice about the teachings of the Forest of Johns is they, they treat your defilements as if they were other beings inside you. You latch on to greed, aversion, and delusion as yours. John Lee says, they come in and they possess you. And seeing them as somebody else is a useful exercise in not-self. These are identities that you've identified with for a long time. And they've had power in your mind for a long time. How would you deal with them if you saw them as somebody else? Here it's useful to think about the different ways of dealing with possessing spirits that they have in time. <laughs> one is to chase them out, one is to do, another one is to do battle with them, the third is to convert them. And you have to decide, of your various defilements, which ones require which treatment. With some of them, the more you do overt battle with them, the more they fight back. So if you've got to figure out how you convert them. And the general way of dealing with them is to start out, as a John Fung would recommend, you fill your body with good breath energy. In other words, you lay claim to the body, make it a good place to be. That strengthens you. And then you spread lots of goodwill. The goodwill is a form of indoctrination. For a lot of us, having goodwill for ourselves is hard. We come from a guilt culture. We're taught to feel bad for ourselves, feel that we don't deserve happiness. This is a vein that lies deep in our culture. It's one of the things that John Sowat had most trouble understanding. Where did this come from? He saw people behaving in very self-indulgent ways, and he thought that they had no feelings of guilt about it. But I had to explain to him, guilt runs very deep. So you really do have to teach yourself how to have goodwill for yourself. I talked one time to a person who was working in a meditation center where they taught both Vipassana and Metta. And I asked him if he noticed any difference between the two types of retreatants. He said there were two things. One was that in the Metta retreats, the people would leave nice notes to one another on the note board. You know, I saw that you look kind of down today. I want you to know that I was spreading goodwill in your direction, love and kindness, they would call it. Whereas in the Vipassana retreat, the notes were, who's wearing that loud jacket? Stop moving. The other thing you noticed was that they went through a lot more honey on the Metta retreats. In other words, people being kind to themselves in that kind of way, putting more honey in their tea. Which is goodwill on one level. But a deeper level is you'd have to ask, why would you want yourself to suffer? Because the Buddha doesn't discuss the issue of deserving or not deserving happiness. He says you should take that desire you have for happiness and honor it, knowing that there's a skillful way that you can do it. It's not selfish. It's not self-serving. Or if it is self-serving, it's serving yourself as you're serving others. So first you have to overcome that resistance to wishing yourself well. This requires some some thinking and some discussion inside, asking yourself, who in here wants me to suffer? And there's a part of the mind that says, well, I'd, I'd be okay saying that I have no ability to create true happiness, so I might as well give up and not try, so I'll tell myself that I don't deserve it. And that kind of thinking is basically laziness hiding itself. But as John Lee says there, it's not just you in this body. I've forgotten what percentage of your body is made up of other organisms. But it's pretty large. And who knows 
what their attitudes are. So maybe you're listening to them. So you really claim to yourself, so I will identify with the voice that says, I want to be happy. I want to be happy in a skillful way, in a way that is long-lasting, which requires that it be harmless. Because if your happiness harms other people, they're not going to want it to last. This is why the Buddha says that goodwill is a determination. You have to make up your mind that you really want to develop this attitude. And then when you feel secure in yourself, then you can deal with the voices inside the mind that exemplify greed or aversion or delusion, ill will, whatever the defilement, and realize that in some twisted way they want happiness. And you want to offer an alternative to them. You point out to them, this is the way you've been acting all along, and this hasn't gotten you anywhere. Get you some quick fixes sometimes, but that's all. And then there's the long payback. Would you prefer something that is long-term and harmless? That's the negotiation. I know of a case with the John Furung. He had a student who had what we in the West would call Tourette syndrome. She couldn't live with anybody. But she really wanted to practice the Dharma. So one time she came and offered him some sugarcane juice in the afternoon. He took a slight sip and then he gave the glass back to her and told her to drink the whole glass of juice. And so he started talking to them. He said, who are you? Why are you in here? Why are you harassing this woman? But as he told me, before asking that, he had protected himself and then just spent lots of goodwill. And so the voice said, this woman did this, this, this in a previous life to me, and I don't want to see her get away without punishment. And as he said to the Spirit, he said, you don't think that by doing this you're going to be creating bad karma and she's going to come and try to get you the next time around? There was a moment of silence. So wouldn't it be better if you allowed her to have a normal life, make merit, and then dedicate the merit to you? That way you both benefit? Another moment of silence. And the, the voice finally said, yes, that would be better. So that was the agreement. And from that point on she didn't have the symptoms anymore. So however you want to interpret that, it is a good way of dealing with your defilements, asking them why they want you to suffer. And see that it, wouldn't, it would be in their best interest to stop trying to exert control over you. That's the conversion. That's the negotiation. There are other times when you basically say, look, I just can't have this in my life. And the way you overcome them is by developing as many good qualities as you can. So there's no room for these other things. And then you can get into a discussion about their reasons for why you should give in to your lust or give in to your laziness or give in to whatever. And basically have some arguments. Point out the weakness in their logic, the weakness in their reasoning. until they're weaker and weaker, and then you can convert them. Because every becoming that we take on wants happiness in one way or another. Now, in some cases it sees the happiness as making you miserable, but you have to point out that well, this is not going to be very long-lasting, it's not going to be very healthy, it's not going to be good for anybody at all. Whatever the reasoning that helps that voice in the mind understand. So as I said, this is an exercise in not-self, seeing these voices in the mind 
as something other. And even though they may have had power over you for a long time, they don't have to see them as necessarily powerful beings. A lot of the stories of spirits in Thailand are some very weak but neurotic beings. They're in a pretty miserable place, so they do what they can to scare people. That's what little pleasure they get out of life. But it's, they're pretty weak. I saw a meditation manual one time. There was a drawing in the manual of a tiger. And the face of the tiger was very large and fierce and very realistic looking. But the body of the tiger was origami paper. A lot of our defilements are like that. They come on really strong, but they're paper tigers. But you have to make sure you're strong, make sure that you're heedful. Because they do have a lot of tricks. I mean, after all, they've been tricking you into falling through them for how many lifetimes now? How many aeons? How many universes? They're used to having their way. And you're used to giving in to their weak logic. But as John Sawat said, when you have some discernment, it's like lighting a candle in a dark place, and say in a cave that's been dark for who knows how long. The darkness doesn't have any right to say this little tiny light has no right to come in and chase us away. We've been here before for a much longer time. Where there's light, the darkness has to go. So thank you for bringing a candle into your mind. So you can see what's going on. And change the balance of power inside so that the light wins out. <laughs>